The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Hello, and welcome to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the host for this podcast. My husband is Steve Siegel, and he's the producer of the podcast. Today's episode, numerically, is number 284. However, the subject of today's podcast is so important that we are putting this podcast up kind of ahead of schedule. This podcast features two authors and their book is going to be published on July 12th. However, this book is so important to you, the listener, that we want to make sure you know about it as soon as possible. Please just remember to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a good rating. Also, check out our YouTube channel and give us a thumbs up on our videos and subscribe to our channel. So today's episode, we have an interview with two authors. They are both Pulitzer Prize winning authors. The first one is Scott Hyam. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning member of the Investigations Unit of the Washington Post. Since joining the Post in 2000, he has examined the deaths of foster children, waste and fraud in Homeland Security contracts, the treatment of detainees at Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib prisons, and conflicts of interest on Capitol Hill. The second author that we are talking to today is Sari Horwitz. Sari Horwitz covers the Justice Department for the Washington Post, where she has been a reporter for 38 years. Horwitz has been awarded the Pulitzer Prize four times. In 2002, she shared the Pulitzer for investigative reporting for a series exposing the District of Columbia's role in the neglect and deaths of 229 children placed in protective care. Now, you may wonder what all this has to do with drug addiction. I'm going to tell you. The book that they co-authored, which will be officially released on July 12th, is called American Cartel. And it is all about the pharmaceutical industry. And while you may think you know everything about it, and I did, and we all kind of like to think that Purdue Pharma is responsible for the opioid epidemic, there are other players who are bigger than Purdue Pharma. So I guarantee there are things that you need to know about the pharmaceutical industry and this whole opioid epidemic. So without further ado, let's talk to Scott Hyam and Sari Horwitz. So I am just super excited. Today we have on the podcast co-authors of a phenomenal book that they're gonna tell us about. We have Scott Hyam and Sari Horwitz. Thank you both so much. I mean, I really feel like you guys are celebrities. So I, I really appreciate you being willing to talk to us today. I really do. Well, it, it's thank really great to be us. here. Yeah, thank you, Joni. Absolutely. Well, I am going to start with ladies first. Sari, tell us just a little bit about your background, how you got into, um, you know, what you do for the Washington Post and what Yeah, just take it that far. I'll have Scott do the same thing. And then I want you guys to tell us how you focused in on this whole pharmaceutical industry. Great. So I'm from Tucson, Arizona, and I've been at the Washington Post for 38 years, so a long time. I started like a lot of reporters start on the night police beat, sort of the traditional way of becoming a reporter. And I covered the DC Police Department and crime in the city. And um, then I sort of worked my way through all the different beats of a newspaper. I covered uh, local government, I covered education. um, And eventually um, I got more and more interested in deep dive reporting uh, where we spend more time and kind of do investigative projects. Um, And so, as I said, over that period of time, I did all these beats, but I, I was always most interested in criminal justice. And so um, whenever I worked on projects and many of them Scott and I did together over the years, we'll tell you about those projects, they had a criminal justice bent to them. Um, And eventually I worked my way through the Washington Post beats and came to the national staff and covered the Justice Department and um, did a lot of big stories uh, on criminal justice for the Justice Department. 
And I worked on looking at things like justice on Indian reservations and uh, federal prisons. I went inside a lot of federal prisons for a year long project on that. And wow. um, Scott and I then ended up working a lot together. So that's, I guess we'll sort of segue to that. Absolutely. And I, I would think that doing like rather than just doing beat reporting, but actually being able to get in there and investigate, I would think that that would be more fulfilling, like more like finding out the why of what went on. Not, I'm trying not to make this sound light, but not just that guy was murdered, but what was happening and what was in the background and why did it get, why did that particular crime get treated the way it got treated? So anyway. Well, the I'm, gift of, of investigative reporting, and I think every reporter really wants to do investigative reporting or be investigative reporting, even when they're covering a beat. But the gift we have is time. Mm -hmm. And instead of having a daily deadline, the ability to have to spend months or even years on a topic and turn over every stone and interview every single person, look at thousands of documents. That's what we love to do. And we really um, get a lot of satisfaction out of that kind of reporting. I love that. I love that. Scott, your background, you haven't been there 38 years, right? I, I have not, no, <laughs> but but 22 years. So okay. a fair amount of time. Um, I, uh, I grew up in New York. My father was a New York City homicide detective. Uh, he worked in the South Bronx uh, in, a, in a station house called Fort Apache, uh, which used to be the worst station house uh, in New York City. And I was just fascinated by his work. So I, I grew up uh, in, in a town called Levittown on Long Island, where everybody was like cops and firefighters and, and civil servants. And I just always imagined that one day I would you know, follow my father and be a police officer. And I actually got hired as a cop and my father talked me out of it and said, you know, if you want to go into law enforcement, go into the FBI. It's a much cleaner job. The pay is better. It's not as dangerous. And so I was on this path to go into the FBI and gotten into law school. But by then I had fallen in love with journalism. Um, and so I, I embarked on a path, uh, uh, for, on, on the journalistic path, and, and I decided not to go to law school. And uh, I, I've kind of never looked back. I, I do a lot of the same kind of work, uh, and, and Sari does too. As, as an FBI agent, we just don't have uh, badges and guns and subpoena power, but we kind of do the same types of work. We, we interview sources, we cultivate people, we triangulate documents, we try to find answers to questions that that uh, a lot of people don't want answered. Um, and so it, it's just a, a, a fascinating uh, job. But that I, so I started you know, a little bit different um, than Sari. I started at a small newspaper in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Then I went to the Miami Herald, which is where I really started doing investigative reporting. There's a lot of things to investigate in Miami. So I investigated you know, the mafia and corrupt politicians and corrupt governments and corrupt uh, corporations and land deals, all kinds of things. And I, I really fell in love with that work. And then I got hired at the Baltimore Sun to do that work. And then in 2000, got hired at, at the Washington Post. And <clears throat> when my, my first couple of weeks at the Washington Post, when I came in, um, I, I met Sari and she was like the most welcoming person. And it was, you know, the Washington Post can be a very intimidating place. There's a lot of very good reporters. It's high energy, very intense place. Um, and, you, you know, you want to do really well. And Sari was just like the kindest, nicest person. And we actually wound up working on a project together almost as soon as I came in the door. And we worked together for two years uh, on an investigation into the deaths of foster care children who were supposed to be protected, uh, you know, by the city. And, and, and sadly, they weren't. And and a lot of these kids lost their lives and, and, and unnecessarily. So that was our first project that we've been working on and off uh, with each other ever since. Wow. Yeah, I saw that you guys did that story. Um, being a mother and a grandmother, I don't think I could, I could hear about that particular story. So we probably won't go into that one. But um, okay, so you guys are, you know, you, you work together and um, what, I was also going to just make an editorial comment that I think that sometimes law enforcement's hands may be tied a little bit in terms of what they can and can't say. But I would think as investigative reporters, 
your hands aren't tied so much. You can, you can point the finger, you can get the truth, you can say it. You're not hampered by, I don't want to say, I mean, you have rules and you have ethics, but I'm just saying that sometimes I think maybe your hands aren't tied as much. Would you agree with me on that? Well, I mean, we, we, we follow the facts just like law enforcement does. Um, but, you know, they have to, they have a burden of proof that's beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a little bit different than the burden of proof that, that we have to publish a story. But um, it, it's kind of the same process and it's super rigorous, particularly for investigative reporting at every place I've ever worked in, particularly at the Washington Post, the standards are so high, the standards of proof are so high. So, you know, we want to make sure that, that everything that we print, every word uh, that we write uh, can be backed up. We have lawyers who read every story that, and particularly the stories that Sarah and I do, because a lot of them are very sensitive, involving lots of powerful interests. So um, we, we have a, an intense process that we go through to make sure that, that our stories are, are, are solid, that they, they can be backed up, that they, they are factual, um, and uh, you know, we're not really interested in people's opinions. We're more interested in um, in, in uncovering the truth, finding out uh, what happened, and letting the public know. And that makes total sense. And I don't. I forgive my ignorance. I don't. I. I don't think I said it properly. But I think it was more when you said burden of proof is a little bit different. But I do understand that you guys have to dot every I and cross every T before you can publish because I mean, yeah, otherwise, you know, the entity for whom you are writing or in this case with the book, then you, you can become liable for, for that type of thing. You guys, you, sorry, guys, sorry, Sari, you <laughs> okay. both have been involved kind of in this pharmaceutical story for a while now. I didn't realize um, prior to this morning when I was researching a bit more about what you two have done that there was um, an HBO series that covered some of this information and that was last year. Um, what got you into this area? What made you start looking at the pharmaceutical industry? Well, I, the Washington Post started looking at the industry in 2016. Okay. Um, so, uh, so now this is, I'm working on this for my sixth year. Sari's been doing it for three years. Uh, the, the, the initial idea came from an editor who was just questioning why there were so many uh, middle-aged women who were dying of overdoses. Um, and, and this editor wasn't uh, clear why that was happening and, and assigned a reporter named Lenny Bernstein, who's on our health desk, to, to go try to figure this out. And so he went out and did the, you know, the things that all of us do as reporters. You read what's been written about the subject. You go out and start interviewing people. You start trying to wire that community up, trying to figure out what's happening. You talk to people who are in the drug world. You talk to, um, you talk to uh, drug counselors. You talk to law enforcement. And he started to hear about these drug companies um, and and then he started pulling all the court records and the lawsuits that were being filed against them. And then he heard about a guy named Joe Ranazizi, who was a DEA agent who was in charge of the, the pharmaceutical um, oversight division, basically, at, at the DEA. And, uh, and, and that he had just recently lost his job. And so Lenny went and interviewed him. And then he came back to the newsroom, you know, with the story about how, you know, Joe had been run out of the DEA, that he was trying to hold these companies accountable, and that uh, that lobbyists and members of Congress and, and, and people with inside of his own agency, the DEA and the Justice Department, had derailed his efforts and forced him out of his job. And it sounded like, you know, this kind of uh, crazy story, but it actually turned out to be true. And so Lenny and I began this investigation, and we did a, a joint project with 60 Minutes. And then Sari joined the team. <clears throat> and uh, and then Sari and I started looking at the explosion of fentanyl all over the country. Um, and we traveled all over the place. We went to Ohio. We went up to uh, New England, um, interviewing all kinds of people on the front lines of, of the fentanyl epidemic. And while we were doing that, we had heard that all these lawsuits were being filed um, against the industry. And they were all being consolidated in one giant federal case. 
And, and as part of that giant federal case, there was a data set that the DEA kept that tracks the, the path of every single uh, narcotic in America, from the manufacturer to the distributor to the pharmacy. And that that information had been shared between the parties in this lawsuit. And so we said, well, this is, this is a court record, and this should be made public. And so we went to court, intervened, the judge turned us down, we won on appeal, and we got access to that data set. And we got access to millions of confidential internal emails, memorandums, documents from these drug companies. And, and that, was, that was kind of a game changer for us, right, Sari? We saw things that we never could have imagined. Well, yeah, and let me just add something to that. Um, so when we wanted to get that confidential database, we went to our, uh, the lawyers at the Washington Post and they uh, looked around Washington. We have a law firm that usually represents us in, law sh in Washington. And that law firm was conflicted out because it was representing the drug industry. Ah. And so then they started to go to other uh, law firms around the city. And it turned out all the big law firms, most of the big law firms, all had a conflict. They were all representing the drug company. Wow. And so there was no one in Washington to represent the Post to try to get the secret database. And we ended up going to uh, the lawyers at the Post, ended up finding a lawyer, a lone practitioner in Akron, Ohio, named Karen Lefton. And they went and asked her. She had uh, done some media cases before. She had been highly recommended by other law firms. And she took on this case, sort of a very David and Goliath kind of thing, taking on the big drug industry, the big drug companies, um, taking on the Justice Department, taking on the, the federal judge, really, wow. and trying to say, we want this database. It's very important for the reporting of the Washington Post. And she lost at the district level and then appealed to the Sixth Circuit. Um, and so I think it was the summer of 2019. Is that right, Scott? Mm -hmm. That the, 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 the district, uh, the, the Sixth Circuit overruled uh, Judge Dan Aaron Polster in Cleveland and said that we were entitled to this this data. And when the Washington Post started getting it, there was so much information, so many transactions that the Post had to buy a new high speed computer to even crunch the numbers. Wow. I mean, it was really. Yeah. You know, and we saw that the, that the drug companies had distributed 100 billion doses of oxycodone and hydrocodone across the country. And the numbers were just staggering. And you could see how many were manufactured by which companies, how many were distributed by which companies, how many were dispensed by which pharmacies, all the way down to the retail level. So, you know, your listeners and your viewers can go online right now and put in opioid files in Google and Washington Post, and you can put in your county and you can see exactly how many pills came into your county who manufactured them, who distributed them, and who dispensed them. Um, but anyway, Karen is like one of many like great characters in our book, uh, American Cartel. I mean, it's just the, 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 the book is written through these characters. <laughs> Hold so, up, there it is. Okay, yeah, Sari yeah. has to talk so we can see the book. There we go. There's a, yeah, I mean, our publisher would really want us to show you this book, so okay. And when so, I do uh, the video, I'll pop up a, a picture of it several times, so yeah. Okay. Uh, so there's, uh, I mean, like Joe Ranazizi is, is a great character. You know, he, he grew up in New York. His father wanted to be a pharmacist. And he said, no, I, I want to do something more important. I want to be a DEA agent. He started out by like knocking over meth labs and doing undercover drug buys, all this dangerous stuff in Detroit. And he is, a, you know, he's another kind of like a, a you know, a, a David character in this Goliath story. He's, you know, of these giant corporations that, that these just everyday people are trying to hold accountable. So you got Karen Lefton, you know, you have you have Joe Ranazizi, you have all the people who work for Joe Ranazizi. There's a woman named Mimi Paredes who is this kind of you know like badass young woman who used to be a, a, an attorney for the Navy SEALs and she's working as like you know his legal counsel and they're all trying to hold these companies accountable, and then they all lose their jobs, which is really quite incredible. And, and at the same time, Congress uh, changes the law that makes it so much easier for these companies to distribute drugs and so much harder for the DEA to do its job. So it's, it, it, this book kind of takes you into the labyrinth of this constellation of 
companies and lobbyists and lawyers and and former Justice Department people who are all moving the levers of power. Uh, wow. and, and then the you know the people out on the streets they don't they don't have this kind of power at all and the the the, the, the imbalance between uh, you know the people who who have the power in Washington the people who don't have it in people like in places like West Virginia or Ohio is 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 really sad and really shocking. I. I... I agree with you. Sorry, Sarah. Just one quick thing. I was just going to say that there's power in knowledge. And the fact that you and Sari have written this book and that American Cartel, I'm going to say the title several times, the fact that you've written it and you've put all this information down on paper for anybody to get and read, that's going to be huge because knowledge is power and you are giving people knowledge. Sorry, Sari, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, I just want to add something going back to this database that we got talking about knowledge as power is that we really saw from that. And this is a big theme of our book that people, when they hear about the opioid epidemic, they think about Purdue Pharma, they think the Sacklers, they think OxyContin. And what we saw in this database is it's so much larger than that, that as Scott said, there's this constellation of companies, some you've heard of, some we've never heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, some of them are large, some are small, uh, some are manufacturers, some are distributors, some are pharmacies, they all work together. And you really saw when you looked at the data, how companies like Mallinckrodt, based in St. Louis, we really didn't know much about Mallinckrodt. They're the largest uh, maker of generic oxycodone. They were making and uh, manufacturing so much more than Purdue Pharma and their pills the Mallinckrodt Blues, they called them, um, because they're blue and they have an M on them, which were very popular with people uh, in, in Florida, people who were using uh, drugs. Um, they were they, People don't really know that story. And so right. that's what's very different to what we found in the data, what we heard from interviews, and what we present in this book. Yep, I, yeah, that's like, huge. I read, sorry, yeah, I read that in the press release, Mallinckrodt, and I was, what is that? I've never heard of that, and we've been doing this for five and a half years. We had never heard of this company, uh, and, and, and it's one of the oldest pharmaceutical com companies in the country. And then when we saw the data, like Sarah was saying, they made 30 times the amount of drugs that Purdue Pharma did. 30 times. Uh, they made way more money than Purdue Pharma could ever have imagined. So wow. while Purdue Pharma, many people believe, you know, started this epidemic with OxyContin, a lot of companies saw this market that had been created and they just dove in and they turned, you know, what was a brush fire into an inferno. And, and, and now, you know, we're, we're into this, you know, the, the, this wave of the epidemic where it's just fentanyl all the time. And, and Mallinckrodt manufactured so many of those blue pills. They're, 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 when they have an M stamped on one side and they have a 30 on the other. So it's 30 milligrams of pure oxycodone which was the most popular pill on the street. People would, you know, would kill to get these pills. And so now you can't get them anymore. And guess who's manufacturing M30 milligram pills, although they're counterfeit, the Mexican drug cartels. And they are flooding the country with these exact same pills, except for their fentanyl, they're not oxycodone. Wow. So it just goes to show like how smart the cartels are and how these American drug companies kind of set the table for where we are right now. It, 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 it's kind of shocking. I was just down on the border uh, twice the last six weeks, and it, it's just coming across like a torrent, bags and bags and bags of blue M30 pills. Wow. It, it, it's, it's really something. So anyway, it, you know, it, it took a village for, for, for this, thing to happen for this epidemic to take place. And um, and so in our book, we explain who all these other players are. I mean, a lot of people don't know that CVS, Walgreens, and Walmart are huge defendants in these lawsuits. And, and they just lost a big jury trial recently in Cleveland. And they're about to be fined you know, hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars in that one case alone. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of companies. There's about two dozen companies that are involved in this litigation now. It's the largest um, civil action in, in American history. And it's probably going to be going on for, for several more years. And so far, uh, the companies have paid 
mm, close to forty billion dollars in settlements. Forty with a B billion. Yeah. So that's a lot of money that's going to go into communities to help with drug rehab programs and you know drug addicted babies, etc. But you know if you talk to parents. Um, they, they, they feel that the fines are important and that these settlements are important, but their biggest question is why is nobody in jail? Why are none of the executives of these Fortune 500 companies being held criminally responsible for yep. the place? Well, is, is Malincott even mentioned in any of these lawsuits? Are they mentioned in them? Oh yeah, yeah, oh, okay. they're, they're, they, they, were, they were sued and now they're in bankruptcy. And they, you know, we, there, there's a lot about them in our book. In fact, there was a famous uh, uh, set of emails that came out during the litigation uh, where uh, one of the salesmen referred to uh, the drugs as Doritos and that, the, that they'll just keep making them because th these people are, are addicted and we can make so many of them. I can read you the email. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. You want to hear this email? Yes. It's very short. Hold on a second. Let me let me find it here. So this is a this is an email that it's an email exchange between a drug distributor in 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 the Midwest in Ohio, um, who was writing to the national sales manager of Malincrop, the manufacturer. So it's manufacturers, distributors, and then the pharmacies. So this guy is the middleman, and he writes to this guy Victor Borelli, who is the national sales manager of Malincrop, and says, you know. I need more pills, you know, it, and he says, he says, you know, you know, keep them coming. They're flying out of here. It's like people are addicted to these things or something. Oh, wait, people are. Ha ha. And then Victor Borelli writes back, just like Doritos, keep eating. We'll make more. If you are an addict in recovery, or if you are an addict still struggling to keep your head above water, or if you happen to love someone battling addiction, Jay Lynn's new book, Between the Lines, a memoir about addiction, empathy, and evolution, is a must-read for you. Lind tells the compelling story of his addiction and recovery between the lines of the stories of several other important people he encountered along the way. With a profound recognition of how an addict's choices can upend so many lives, Between the Lines takes us deep into the tragic consequences of addiction and betrayal but leaves us with a message full of gratitude and hope. Between the Lines is available on Amazon or anywhere books are sold. Also, listen to Jay's podcast, Between the Lines, on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, Go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. Sometimes, the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. The service comes with a free one hour consultation with Bobby. The, the documents that we got, you know, are there's a lot of shocking things like that that are in the book that we got from, uh, from you know, intervening into these lawsuits and getting these documents unsealed. But they were just making fun of addicts left and right, like dehumanizing people who were addicted to these drugs. And, and, and maybe it made them easier, uh, made it easier for them to do what they were doing because they didn't see them as human beings. They just saw them as a as a market, as a and and, and were just selling drugs to them. Um, and there's there's another parody um, 
that somebody had written to the tune of Beverly uh, uh, Hillbillies. And some of your listeners or viewers may not remember this show, but in the 1960s, there was like this parody comedy show about a bunch of hillbillies from like Arkansas or wherever, and they hit oil on their land and suddenly they're, they're gazillionaires and they move, they move to, the, to, the, to, to, to Beverly. And, and so they wrote a parody about this. Another drug company did, and, 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 I, and I won't sing it because I'm not a very good voice, but I can, I can, I can read to you uh, the, the parody. Let's see here, where, where is the parody? Uh, okay, so it starts with, um, come and listen to a story about a man named Jed. Poor mountaineer barely kept his habit fed. Then one day he was looking at some tube and saw that Florida had a lax attitude about pills, that is, hillbilly heroin, OC, meaning oxycodone. Well, the first thing you know, old Jed's driving south. Kinfolk said, Jed, don't put too many in your mouth. Said sunny Florida is the place you ought to be, so they loaded up the truck and they drove speedily. South, that is, pain clinics, cash and carry, a bevy of pillbillies. And it ends with, well, now it's time to say howdy to Jed and all his kin. And they'd like to thank Rick Scott for kindly inviting them in. They're all invited back to this locality to have a heap and help in Florida hospitality. Pill mills, that is. Buy some pills. Take a load home. Y'all come back now here. Oh. And that was circulated over and over and over again inside of one of the drug companies. And, you know, people were like, oh, great to see this again, you know, with like smiley face emojis. And, and meanwhile, you know, thousands <laughs> and thousands of people are dying. It's like dehumanizing the people who are addicted to these drugs and the people that are dying from overdoses. It, and, and like you say, it's probably the only way they could sleep at night was to try and figure out a way to make light of it. But it's pretty it, it, disgusting. It's horrible. You know, I mean, look, Sari and I have seen some really dark things in, in our days as reporters. Uh, you know, in Miami, in D.C., Sari on the crime beat saw a lot of horrible things. And, and, I, and I think that we agree that we've never seen anything as horrible as this. Wow. And, you know, it's interesting because that email that Scott just read you, that parody was it just remained in, in internal email within the company. And then with this big lawsuit that we can certainly tell you more about because it's a really interesting, this mass tort, the biggest one in ever in American history. There was a trial in, in um, Charleston, West Virginia last summer. And the executives involved with passing around that email, one in particular took the stand and it came out in testimony. The plaintiff's attorneys asked about it and the Pillbilla email came out. And it was written about by uh, local reporters. And the next thing that happened was um, a, a, a basketball player, uh, Rex Chapman, who has done a lot of work uh, on the issue of recovery and treatment. He put it on Twitter. He said, wow, look what's happening. Look what just came out in this West Virginia trial. And it, it went viral. And there were actually some death threats um, uh, brought against that executive. And the, the judge had to summon all the parties together in his chambers and say, whoa, uh, no more of these emails. I, I get the point. <laughs> no more <laughs> of those emails. <laughs> wow. Right. So we have a lot of scenes like that. You know, like the, the first half of our book, is like a detective story where the, the DEA is trying to figure out like where are all these pills coming from and who's responsible, and what's happening, why are all these people, you know, dying? And then they get taken down. And then the second half of the book is like a legal thriller where it takes you through this, you know, giant case that's still pending. And you meet all these, you know, remarkable lawyers. I mean, one of them is a guy named Mark Lanier, who Sari can tell you about, who's just a fascinating guy. He's, he's probably the most successful trial attorney in America, and you, you've never heard of him. Um, but Sari, you want, you want to talk about Mark a little well, bit? The character. thing about Mark is he comes into the story, before I tell you about Mark, he comes in later. He comes in sort of in the middle of the story. First, there are these other attorneys. I think Scott and I should tell you first about Paul Farrell from West Virginia, who 
his family has been in Huntington, West Virginia for generations. And he, you know, he looks around at the, at the devastation in West Virginia and thinks we got to do something about this. And he was able to get all the information from Scott told you about where Joe Renazizi from those cases Joe made. And he started suing the drug distributors. And he, he started doing it on the theory of a legal theory of public nuisance. The idea that public nuisance law is usually for an illegal trash, a trash dump or lead paint um, or uh, closing down a crack house. And he said, look, these companies who have dumped all this poison into West Virginia, they're a public nuisance. That's right. So he, he brought this case. He gathered a lot of attorneys. He brought in lots of other law firms. And he filed what's called multi-district litigation. It's an MDL. And this sounds kind of bureaucratic, but but what it is is you bring together all the lawsuits against the opioid makers and distributors and pharmacies in the country and put it under one roof. And this happened in Cleveland. And so Scott and I write about how all the attorneys involved in this, there are basically 500 attorneys representing the plaintiffs and 500 attorneys representing the defendants. And they... They all have pretty big egos, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they start fighting amongst themselves. Who's going to control the case? Who's going to argue these cases in court? Who's going to be the, the in charge? And some of the more experienced trial attorneys from New York say, we know someone who needs to be the lead lawyer in the courtroom in this case. And sorry, Paul Farrell, who started this uh, <laughs> litigation. Sorry, everybody else. But we have to bring in Mark Lanier. And we call Mark Lanier the magician um, because he's this very experienced trial attorney. He lives on a massive estate outside of Houston. Um, he has chickens and um, he has what llamas and all kinds of animals. <laughs> he has orchards and he has a little train on his property and he's a character and he has a, a theological library. And, and but he's brought in billions and billions of dollars in these mass tort cases and his style in the courtroom, he's very folksy. He He's folksy. He brings in religious references. He's just so down to earth. And he took what's a very complicated case, because as we've told you, it involves manufacturers, distributors, and pharmacies, 24 of them. And he breaks it down for the jury. Ju the jury. And he does things like he holds up a first edition um, of Wizard of Oz. And he reads from the scenes where it's like, poppies, poppies, and she falls asleep. And he makes the point that, see, we've always known about addiction and about narcotics and about poppies. So he just, he's fabulous in the courtroom and really, really successful. And they brought him into this case and he's the one who just won this trial in uh, Cleveland against the pharmacies. Wow. Wow. I mean, he's the kind of lawyer who, you know, the, the, the defendants will, will make an objection and he'll turn to the judge and say, you know what, Honor, Your Honor, that's that's a pretty good objection. I would sustain that. And so, <laughs> you know, he, he just like, you know, the, he the controls jurors, the whole he controls the orchestrates the whole thing. He has his own team. He only works with those people. He has, you know, people who are like, you know, jury psychologists and, you know, the reading the room and people who are the audio visual people and he has this whole system of putting together cases and he is the most successful trial attorney in america in fact he just won a two billion dollar judgment against johnson and johnson in the talcum powder case that was just upheld by the u.s supreme court two billion dollar verdict wow so he's uh so anyway, when he our, came our book is filled with these with these kinds of characters who right. are fighting against the these drug companies, and then the drug companies have some of the best lawyers, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, they've hired these law firms that are just powerhouses, and so you know, watching these attorneys face off in, in court is, is is quite a spectacle. It's like they're gladiators, you know, going. There. We have lots of description of these courtroom battles and these scenes and jousting and you know people winning and people losing and and you know and you know the way things stand now you know, there have been some wins for for the defendants and there has been some loses uh, for, for them and vice and same thing with the with the plaintiffs who are going after them they won some very big cases and they just lost a really big case um, yep. in west virginia uh, yeah 
But so, what, was, what was striking to, to Scott and to me as we uh, got to know the lawyers is, yes, of course, all the places we've traveled, we've met so many families in these communities. Almost every family has been affected by the opioid epidemic. Someone, a relative, a friend of a friend um, has, has died. But it was so striking to see how it also really affected the lawyers. A lot of these key lawyers in, in the case uh, representing the 4,000 cities, towns, and, and Indian reservations, um, those lawyers themselves uh, knew someone personally who had died from an opioid addiction or had a son who was struggling with addiction. Um, and that was a motivation also for them. Our, our, one of our main uh, characters, Paul Farrell, who we talked to you about from West Virginia, he had a very close friend, and we have a whole chapter in the book about this man, Mark Zaban, who was a star athlete. Scott can give you all the particulars because he remembers all the particulars, but he was a star athlete in high school and in college. He went to the Ohio State University and he, he got an injury and he uh, the doctors began prescribing Oxycontin and he became addicted and his life totally fell apart. And it, you know, it haunted Paul Farrell and he told us about this. Scott and I really wanted this to be a part of our book. We wanted Mark to be a chapter in our book and we went to him and he told us a story. It was very emotional and very hard because he's on the other side now. He's in recovery. He's trying to put back his life, he's trying to be with his family and his children. And it was very brave of him in the end. We really wanted him to tell his story, but he wasn't sure whether he wanted to do it. And he decided that although he was nervous about this and it might affect his life now, it was very brave and courageous of him. He decided if my story in your book can help somebody who's struggling now, I want to do it. And uh, Mark Savan did that for us. That's, and for all of the people who will read this book. And I say that to yeah. every former addict that comes on this podcast, they have to talk about a part of their life that is not something that they're particularly proud of. But when they do that, like Mark in your book, it helps somebody. It does. Oh yeah, uh, it, it it was it was a very emotional experience. I think for 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 both of us, um, getting to know Mark, uh, working through all of his, um, you know, his his hesitancy, which is totally understandable. Do I really want to go back to those really dark days? <clears throat> I mean, he lost. He had <clears throat> six children, so he lost his kids. He lost his wife. He lost. He had a really uh, high paying. Uh, important job. He lost that. Uh, he lost his house. He lost everything. And he finally like pieced everything back together again. And and he was really struggling with whether uh, to come forward. And he met with his family. He, he talked to his brother, who he really looks up to. Um, and, and like Sari said, they come from a, a huge sports family. You know, like his uncle played for the New York Giants. He was recruited by Ohio State as a quarterback, which if anybody knows anything about college football, it's a huge honor uh, to, to, to be recruited by Ohio State. And he also played for Marshall, which is another you know, big, big football school. Uh, Randy Moss was his wide receiver. I don't know. Remember, Randy, he's a Hall of Fame uh, wide receiver. And <clears throat> so he was destined for greatness. And, and, you know, all these injuries took a toll. And, you know, and, and then when he started down this, this path of taking oxy, uh, there, there was no turning back. And so when he, you know, when he finally opened up to us, I think it was it was cathartic for him. He talked about things that he'd never told anybody. Um, and we were both in tears and Sari too, talking about some of this stuff. And he said, right. you know, and, and, and for us, it was very important for us, right, Scott, because we're writing about companies, we're writing about corporations, we're writing about documents internally. And to have the face of Mark Zaban always with us, that that's what this story is about. Yes, it's about the companies, of course, and their culpability, but we had to always have the result of what they'd done. And it was so important to have Mark uh, be a part of what we were experiencing, right? Yeah, yeah. And he's really he's really glad that he did it. He's really proud of himself that he did it. Uh, you know, he has a he has a copy of the book now, and, and we're waiting to hear back from him. So uh, we hope that we did him proud. But uh, he's a really good guy who, you know, uh, he went to hell and came back um, and uh, and he's doing really well. And so, 
you know, at one point he said, you know, the getting high was more important than my kids. And it breaks my heart to say that. And he said, at one point, I said, I don't even know if I want that in your book. And we said, you know, Mark, it's so important that people, you know, hear that from you, that that's how low you had gone. And look at look at how you've come back. And that's an inspiration, I think. Yep. And, and I mean, it was that's so important. When they, when they go that low, the fact that they can come back and they can put their life back together, I think that's huge for yeah. the people who listen. I really do. And the people who read your book. Yeah. So and it was there. inspirational and, just, you know, just to us. I mean, we're not you know, taking drugs or anything, but just as human beings, his story is so inspiring um, because it would have been so easy for him just to just keep on taking, you know, oxy until, you know, he just stopped breathing with like so many other people and just and, and just gave up. But, you know, he 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 did it for his kids. And uh, and I think a lot of us do things for our kids and for our family and and he put them first and and, you know, he saved his life. And I think that's also an inspiration, not just to the community at large, but to his kids, um, you know, yeah. who, uh, you know, saw what he where he went and how he came back. Yeah. And it was so important to contrast Mark's story with what's happening inside the corporate boardrooms, inside the halls of these firms where they're joking uh, about addicts and joking about their pills and what their pills do. So, yep. There's, a, there's another yep. character in our book. His name is Eric Kennedy, and he uh, he's an, uh, an attorney for the plaintiffs uh, suing the companies. And uh, his son died of a fentanyl overdose. Uh, he took cocaine that he didn't know was was laced with uh, fentanyl and he died. And and so uh, we met Eric just a few months after his son had passed away. Um, and, um, and he was uh, intimately involved in this litigation. And Paul Farrell asked him if he would like to take a couple of the witnesses um, in, in the case, meaning some of the, the defendant witnesses. And he said that he would like to do that. So. Uh, he did the deposition of, of a man who runs the trade organization for the drug distributors. And so um, that, uh, that deposition was, is an incredible thing to watch and to read. And so we have a whole chapter about how he mustered the courage and strength to, 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 to confront this man who he felt was partly and, and his clients were partly responsible and, and the entire opioid industry was responsible for his son's death, not directly, but indirectly. Yep. And, and he was able to like stay really, really cool, really calm. He did a, you know, a, a highly skilled deposition. And, and at the end of the deposition, he walked out of the, of the room. It was during COVID, so it was remote. And he just broke down in the arms of his uh, secretary. Um, wow! But you know, we have a we have a lot of moments like that in the book, and, and a lot of characters who um, showed an enormous strength and power in the face of uh, in, in the face of enormous power and influence. Well, I want to thank you both for <laughs> writing this book, American Cartel. I want to thank you for I don't even know how many hours, if you've ever counted them up, you've spent looking at what I will classify as pure evil on the part of a lot of the people involved in this drug business, in this pharmaceutical business. I'm sorry, there's, there's evil there. I'm not saying everybody is, but there is an element there that is pure evil. And the fact that you guys go in there and confront that and look at it and, you know, can stay with it long enough. I'm, I'm sorry, I would have given up. I would have gotten disgusted and I would have given up. Okay. So I'm just saying how much I appreciate what you guys have done in writing this book. Well, thank you. Thank and, you. And we, we really appreciate what you guys are doing. It's so important. Uh, and, you know, the recovery community and we've dealt with uh, and, and are, you know, talking and dealing with a lot of parents and a lot of survivors and, and in, our, in our own lives. I mean, my, my brother is in recovery. My next door neighbor's son died of, of an opioid overdose. 
uh, my colleague uh, from Allentown, her son died. I mean, everywhere you go, um, they're, they're, you, you, everybody knows somebody or you know somebody who knows somebody. And, and that collective power of all those people coming together, um, I think, could, could really make a difference in this space. I agree. Sari, thank you. Thank you for so much for having us on. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. The book is American Cartel. You can get it on Amazon and everywhere the books are sold. It's out today. You need to read it. There's information in this book that you need to know. And in the same way that Scott said, it doesn't matter whether you yourself have been an addict or whether your child or your parent was an addict, you are touched by this. And if you think you aren't, then you have your head in the sand. And I don't care where you are, you are affected by this drug pandemic and you need to read this book, American Cartel by Scott Hyam, Sari Horwitz. Thank you both so much for talking to us today. Thank you, Joni. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to the interview today. I'm putting up an image here that shows you the cover of the book. And also you can pre-order the book. It won't be published until the 12th, but because we got this interview in as one of the first interviews with Scott and Sari, we wanted to let you know that the book is available for pre-order right now. This book is a must read for anyone who has been affected by the opioid epidemic and who wants to become better educated on the subject. It's a scary book. I started reading it. It is not a hard read, but I will tell you it's a bit hard to confront. And what these two people have confronted is amazing. So Thank you so much for listening. We will have our regularly scheduled podcast this next Thursday, which will be an interview. But we felt that this was so important that we wanted to get it out to you right away. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.